Uh, it's great to be here in Berlin with you all today. Um, a lot of the content and concepts proposed in this conversation uh, are heavily uh, influenced and catalyzed by the great work that's being done in the uh, Linux user space community. And so it's a delight to be able to be here uh, speaking with you today. Uh, I'd like to start uh, today by asking a uh, simple question. Uh, where did you first deploy Linux? Uh, for some, it may have been on a server uh, and, uh, or in the cloud, uh, using containers for the first time maybe. Uh, for others, it could have been on your desktop PC or your workstation. Uh, and for me, it was on my motorbike. <laughs> uh, this was about two decades ago. Uh, my passion for technology combined with my love of motorbiking uh, really sparked a deep obsession with embedded systems design. And it all started uh, with this simple idea, what if I could remote start my motorbike using my phone? Today, this concept seems pretty straightforward, uh, even common. But the, this criteria that, that this happened in, circa 2006, 2007, a time before the iPhone, where Palm Pilots and Blackberries dominated and Windows Mobile still stood a chance. <laughs> uh, this was actually also before the Raspberry Pi, that credit card sized computer that we all have tucked away in our closet for that weekend project. Uh, my motorbike project was the epitome of hacker mode. It was a mismatch of parts from router designs and compact PC components, Palm Pilots, and uh, it was really a journey into understanding the uh, almost criminal domain of what it took to be able to accomplish such an effort. I learned the technical requirements and it was so closely key to that of hot wiring that uh, I uh, shortly thereafter realized what I've ended up doing. And so I managed to pull it off. Surely hardware is hard, but the connectivity is even more complex. Distributed systems like this one demand distributed state. And uh, that means that you have to manage the data caching on both sides of the pipe. There's the authentication, authorization, communication protocols, design, development, data synchronization, all of which make this invisible space between devices a tricky design challenge. And as we all know, there are two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation, naming things in off by one errors. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, the iPhone ushered in a new era of mobile development, and while the Raspberry Pi did eventually make the complexity and cost of portable Linux devices more accessible, these two pivotal events became the catalyst for the Internet of Things. And over this time, significant progress was being made in simplifying web application development through the rise of general purpose frameworks. I dedicated the next 10 years of my life to developing an open source framework that would bring similar ease, connectivity, and reliability to the creation of embedded IoT products. Uh, this framework is called NERVS. And NERVS is built on top of the battle-tested core of the Erlang VM, uh, sort of an esoteric language at its time. Uh, it was originally developed for use in telephone switching networks uh, back in the uh, early 80s, late 70s. It was meant to be able to operate in the harshest conditions, and I figured that with its distributed process modeling was a great foundation to be able to develop on top of. And with this new power came new possibilities. I envisioned a future of IoT systems comprised of a concert of microprocessors and microcontrollers. Bringing together one of this visions was this wireless jacket that uh, I ended up uh, creating to go along with my boner bike. Uh, it functioned as an authenticatable key of sorts to start and stop the bike. As I approached the motorbike, it would just start. i get off and walk away, and it would stop. I also embedded multicolor LEDs into the jacket, which synchronized with the motorbike's turn signals and brake lights, added a new layer of safety system and control. 
As more peripherals and firmware were integrated, it became clear that the future of connected IoT product design was going to be extended well beyond the WAN connected devices. As such, I ended up spending the next 10 years uh, working as a consultant in the space and helping a variety of companies design and deploy hundreds of products into the field. Today, I'm the co-founder and chief product officer at a company called Peridio. Uh, we are a software distribution and device management platform focusing on creating accelerated tools and platforms to be able to help design and deploy these new types of embedded devices. Now, hardware is still hard, but the great strides that we're making in software development are making it easier. Nowadays, we have things like machine learning that are being pushed closer and closer down into embedded systems, and they're demanding more things from us, power requirements, be able to get smaller, faster, and more efficient. That's actually taxing a lot of the designs that we have today in the embedded cloud or the cloud-based environment tooling. And so this is where I'd like to be able to focus. There's been this great push towards being able to make software easier, but there's still some more work to be done. And so for today, I would like to propose that we take the following journey. We're going to start by looking at a little bit of an evolution of how hardware and software interplay with each other and how they've kept up. We'll look at what is left in that domain to be able to solve. What areas can we actually improve upon? And then we'll take a look at some of the proposed features and opportunities that we are pushing forward in Avocado to be able to help make the development experience and the manufacturing and production experience of embedded products much easier. Finally, we'll look at a little bit of the afterlife, as you will, uh, after it leaves the bench of what it looks like to be able to try to maintain embedded products that are in the field. So let's get started. First, a little bit about some history. Where have we come from and, well, where are we headed? With hardware and software interplay, we can think back to the early days of the web. This was, let's say, between the mid-90s and early 2000s. Uh, what we saw was that uh, up until that point, hardware and software really shared a lot in common. Uh, firmware at the time was primarily being built for either general purpose computers, <coughs> excuse me, uh, or actually embedded products. And as the web took off, software abstractions started to explode. What really helped here was that the hardware that was being used to drive and deliver web-based experiences was becoming more commoditized. General purpose computing was used to be able to build and layer cloud solutions that enabled providers these days, hyperscalers, to be able to abstract away all of the hardware concerns. I remember a time when we used to pride ourselves on how many servers we had running to be able to stand up that one application how much management actually was in the background, how much power you had behind you. These days, we can talk about virtual CPU usage and maybe some memory footprints, but containerization technologies have really taken a lot of that out of the way. And as such, we've ended up giving birth to an entire new wave of programmers who are just focusing on cloud-based infrastructures. These kinds of developers are now not having to deal with the same kinds of real constraints that we used to have to in the past. This divergence kind of led to this entire group to not have to focus on these domains as much anymore. <coughs> and as such, we've essentially trained an entire new swath of developer on this unbounded domain of um, programming capability. And as such, it kind of led to this point where, well, what happens when you give a adolescent programmer or an adolescent an unbounded room? They will fill it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry.
<clears throat> Conceptually speaking, <clears throat> hardware is hard, and it's always behind. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. Thank you. Hardware is essentially always behind compared to the rate of innovation of software domains. And as such, we ended up finding that more and more of this is becoming modularized. And so we've seen over the years Wi-Fi modules that no longer um, contain their own firmware code, but it's being shipped as part of the kernel. And as more and more of these components start to be able to slowly over time get baked into reusable devices that we can use in new technologies and new designs, <coughs> mm. we see this also with machine learning. Nowadays, machine learning is starting to become embedded more into sensors that we're going to see in the next wave of these hardware modular designs. An example of this actually is kind of funny. It comes from a recent experience that I had at an amusement park with my children. Universal Studios started to be able to um, implement some of this stuff at their parks. What we've seen was that they've taken uh, magic wands in the Harry Potter world, and um, the wands themselves are quite um, dumb. They're passive devices. The only thing really special about them is that at the end of the wand, there's a little gem that reflects uh, infrared light. And the uh, trick that you walk up to to be able to try to interact with uses a camera and a UV light system to be able to read with almost like a persistence of vision what the wand is drawing in midair. They're actually using computer vision based technologies to try to understand if the spell that you cast is the one that should actually perform the trick. And so what we're seeing now is that the price point and the complexity of these, uh, this technology has reached a level in which it's being adopted and used in even novel use cases. So it's only a matter of time before we have more modules with running more software. And so what do I mean by this? Well, traditional embedded development used to run in simple domains. We would have microprocessors that would just run your um, sort of operating systems and higher level code, and microcontrollers, which would run more of an embedded firmware. <coughs> these days, we're starting to see more of these heterogeneous computational platforms. These are comprised of multiple microcontrollers, multiple microprocessors, neural accelerators, digital signal processing, and a variety of different peripherals. This is an example of how we've sort of layered and built the complexity downwards and crystallized it really into the hardware. So let's talk about where the embedded edge is. The term edge is really used a lot these days. And so it's helpful for us to, for this talk, describe where we're actually looking to be able to speak about. And most people will be able to say anything that's in the edge is basically outside of the data center or cloud solutions. Now consistently that seems to be pointing towards gateways or on-prem servers. But there's also references that people would make to industrial computation or consumer electronics even, even low power devices. Because really, where is the edge? Well, when we're talking about it today, we're gonna to focus on these domains, the truly lower level embedded domains. And so what considerations do we really make when we're making embedded designs? 
For one, we need to be able to appreciate the development experience. Development for embedded devices is traditionally hard. There's often really low power devices that you're not going to compile directly on. And then compiling for those devices usually main, uh, requires a lot of uh, uh, overhead when it comes to maintaining uh, software development kits or cross-compilable tool chains so that you can build from more powerful hosts. In addition, when we consider embedded requirements, we have to look for the highest levels of fault tolerance. Atomic updates, immutability, reproducibility. These devices are being deployed in areas outside of our control. This is something really that the web can take for granted sometimes. When making a deployment, often maybe even hundreds of times a day, there's always the ability to uh, ensure that uh, you can escape from an, a bad deployment or a bad uh, situation, mostly because that environment is under the control of the cloud provider. There's always a means of being able to update that. And we also need to be able to act autonomously. This means that while there's been great uh, strides in improving and adding root of trust and TPM, even integrity checks into uh, workstations and server infrastructure, that on embedded devices, there's even more complexity when it comes to ensuring things like secure boot or uh, encryption. Additionally, one thing that's not usually considered is manufacturing and the scalability of the manufacturing line. When building embedded products, you not only need to be able to create the product itself, but oftentimes design and develop the manufacturing processes that go around the uh, ongoing uh, creation of those on the manufacturing line. And time is money when it comes to manufacturing. You want to ensure that it takes the least amount of time to be able to build the most amount of your product. Uh, finally, things that we have to consider too are the time to boot and power consumption, real-time processing. Now, some of these uh, have some new uh, solutions today, which is great. Um, it's wonderful to be able to see that the uh, Linux RT patch set came in and that we can start to be able to expect a little bit more in uh, doing some more real-time work within the kernel uh, and the user space. Um, but there's other ways that we can end up solving some of these power concern problems as well. Uh, one of which that's interesting can be found in a pretty simple example, which is battery powered modern security cameras. There's a lot of these on the market today. And a lot of them will actually end up using one of these types of modern heterogeneous architectures. The reason why is because in this case there's a NPU or a neural accelerator unit in this case, uh, can actually run a machine learning model to be able to do things like uh, detect whether or not a human is present. And uh, the uh, domains themselves on the top half of this for the microprocessors, you can consider that to be like the high power domain. And the below uh, is the low power domain. For a uh, majority of the processing time, the device will sit in this low power domain and it'll actually shut down the high power processors. You can think of that as a hibernation to disk of uh, the, uh, um, the actual um, OS that's running up there. And then the microcontroller code will be smart enough to just sit and process frames from the camera and run them through inference on the NPU. If there's a human that's detected that's present, it'll give a little bit of an interrupt and it'll say, hey, wake up, I got something going on here. And then the buffer will come in and pass it off to the uh, Linux OS uh, and your user space programs there to be able to do some more higher power processing. This is great because um, we have new ways of being able to answer the problem of, well, I can't run embedded Linux because I need the processor to be up and active fast. This new solution can offer a mitigation for a variety of those different cases. So that's sort of the state of the union and the, where hardware and software have come along. Now let's look at some of the problems in this space that we're really trying to be able to solve. As mentioned, with heterogeneous processing comes complications. More processors, more code. 
deployments have become more complicated in these cases. Now you have yourself not just uh, somebody who's specializing and developing for uh, embedded Linux-based systems, but possibly people who are also specializing in lower-level firmware code that can run on um, microcontroller architectures as well. And in addition, this introduces data science, machine learning models. And on these lower power devices, usually you can't just reach for off the shelf means of being able to implement machine learning models on neural accelerators. Every processing platform is a bit different and they all have requirements that you need to be able to quantize the models themselves to fit within the domain so that they can actually run efficiently. In addition, because we're introducing some higher power processing like machine learning models, we have a need to be able to, again, raise the security baseline. This means not just a uh, root of trust in the case of secure boot or encryption at rest. While those things are very important, they're also still today difficult for people who are in the adolescence of their designs to be able to get right. And we'll look at that a little bit more and how that lever uh, works. But in addition, we have a lot of these custom platforms. <clears throat> when it comes to designing hardware and software solutions, oftentimes when we're going to mass production, we need to be able to ensure that we can make the cost efficient. This means usually not buying products that are uh, available, like um, maybe industrial PCs, depending on the installation case. But for the case of truly embedded, maybe consumer electronic devices, you're going to be involving hardware uh, developers to be able to produce custom designs that inevitably are going to feed back to require software changes. This is a little bit like how ARM uh, uh, has become this place where, while today uh, si ARM 64 based technologies <coughs> allow us to treat these systems a little bit more like PCs, it's still important that we have an escape hatch for us to be able to create extremely minimal uh, kernels and minimal user systems for uh, means of updating or even um, means of uh, connectivity and updating over um, expensive data links. And finally, it's also going to introduce developers who need to be able to run embedded UIs and UX experiences <coughs> and connectivity to web services. So what does a modern embedded development team look like? Well, these new multimodal problems really do require multidisciplinary teams. You have all of these different personas contributing to the same sort of package. And previously, that would mean that everything that's being contributed to produce that is sort of hitting this integrator bottleneck. Usually there's somebody on the team or a group that knows how to be able to bring it all together. And interestingly, that individual, when they experience an error, maybe compiling the machine learning model down to the format that's necessary to run on this processor, and they, when they experience that error, they don't necessarily know or have the domain experience to realize how to fix it. And this causes this bottleneck, this causes this issue of integration. So how do we deal with some of this stuff? In addition, what we kind of want when we develop embedded systems is we want things to be developer friendly. We want them to be production ready. We also want them to be able to be designed for manufacturing. And this is sort of that like connected lever. Early in the development stages of embedded devices, when things are developer friendly, we'll usually reach for sandbox tools like installing uh, full Ubuntu or Debian onto these boxes so that we can feel around in the dark and really uh, get an idea of how we want the software to be architected. But this is not a production ready system. Conversely, if we make it so that all the seatbelts are on, then what ends up happening is that the developers struggle with trying to be able to understand what needs to get deployed and put onto the devices. 
Also, when you develop one product, you also have to develop another to be able to make it manufacturable, to test it, to ensure that it's functioning and working. All of these considerations can come together in the middle for what we're looking to be able to actually solve, which is a really, truly unicorn of a place to get right. And so, where's the gap? Well, as I mentioned, today we do have a lot of tools and resources to reach for. When it comes to workstation distributions, they often offer core minimized versions of the OS that can be used to be able to deploy onto these devices. They still come with a bit of fat kernels or mutable package management utility that ends up uh, uh, having some side effects that in the case of truly embedded domains isn't really desirable. On the far other side of the spectrum, we have low-level build tools like Yocto and Buildroot. These can produce really small, slim-kerneled systems with high reproducibility <coughs> and can even be used for custom hardware designs quite easily. Where we're looking to be able to fit is in the middle. The proposed concepts for Avocado are ones where we embrace parts of the build system with a distribution that can be used to create extensible, composable, and always secure from the start embedded devices. From the application development side of things, we see containerized solutions that are a birth from the expansion that we've had in web technologies. Now, those usually carry with it high complexity or higher resource consumption. And for some edge devices, this makes a lot of sense. It makes for good workflows. But they're often isolated. <coughs> These were developed to be able to run multi-tenant workloads in highly uh, secured ways on commoditized hardware. On the far other side of the spectrum, we deal with native build technologies, where we have to work, uh, wrestle with tool chains and the sysroot and SDKs. These also carry complexities of tying them into CI-CD pipelines. And once again, we look to be able to go into the middle with dev containers and namespaces, a blend of both for their applications. This lets us provide managed SDKs and hardware in the loop based development. So a little last bit about the embedded product complexity. I mentioned manufacturing considerations. Well, when manufacturing these devices, as I mentioned, you often need to build two. One that's the design that you're trying to manufacture, and one that's a design that knows how to test the design that you're trying to manufacture. Oftentimes, you end up having to be able to write um, uh, testing frameworks that are custom to be able to run on usually really old um, technology that's at the manufacturing facility available for you. So you can do things like, how do you write to the initial root file system? Well, in embedded domains, usually you're looking at an EMMC, which is effectively a soldered down uh, SD card. But there's not really an SD interface to that. Can you hit it through that bed of nails image that we see? Or is there a way to be able to use it over USB? And if you do, oftentimes what we see is with the uh, slower aspects of these devices, it takes a while to be able to write all of these bits to, the, to uh, that EMMC device. And as I mentioned, time is money. And in addition, well, what do we do about handling partitioning, encryption, the identity certificate? And we'll see the complexity as that unfolds a little bit more. But there is a um, strenuous nature to being able to uh, provision these for the first time. And also, how do we manage the distributions? We created that software bundle. Well, getting it onto devices should be easy. Now, in the case of our deployments, we don't want to just mass deploy it to things. We might cause catastrophic issues, some of which most of us here may have read in the news recently or experienced. We want to roll this out slowly, so we need some orchestration mechanisms. We need to be able to say, let me take these pieces here and then make them like, say, a canary device. These might be ones that are within close proximity to you so that you can do something and intervene if something goes wrong. And if those pass, well, then let's just roll it out to the rest of the fleet. 
Now, this is a minimum example of what kind of complexity we might see. So uh, in this case, well, what happens if the uh, complexity starts to be able to get higher? We change a piece of hardware in it. We end up seeing here, we have maybe in the case of hardware design, one of the components we used to use is no longer available. And so we end up uh, creating a new one. And now we have a matrix of opportunities to be able to deal with. And finally, updates and observability. Well, these traditional things aren't going to work for us here. How do we end up writing logs? SD cards, MMC devices, they'll wear the parts really fast. How do we store important debug information? And how do we make sure that when things go wrong when we're not there, we can roll back? So what are the goals for us to be able to focus on? Let's start with what uh, the Avocado proposes for the hardware and platform development components. With the advancements of use in ARM to be able to create the system-ready specification, we follow a similar suit, and we try to be able to comprise all of the firmware that's required to boot your device into the boot partitions on the EMMC. This way, the bootloader that you're choosing, uh, using UFI or even U-Boot, which is often found on a lot of these embedded domains, can be placed inside of this, and you can expect that subsequent following code will end up just working because device tree and some platform specificities are included there. This means that we can use up, upstream Linux kernel support, and everything is sort of consolidated. From there, we use AB root partitions and AB kernel loading areas. This is for integrity, so that we can ensure that we have a warm spare to fail back to. For composability, we propose that a lot of this is foundationally built on top of the user merge. We don't see this often used in uh, Yocto or even that. It's an option you can turn on. Uh, and I heavily promote the uh, ability to do so. We design our system to be able to be sort of a fat init RAM FS. A lot of uh, what we stuff, system D, and uh, minimally into the init RAM FS, will get the system into a ready state so that using uh, 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 dynamic uh, disk, um, we can actually mount the right user partition for whether we're on A or B, just by make, making sure that the uh, header that describes the root FS uh, is atomically updated between those two. That's sort of the last mile that we have to end up ensuring is in place so that we can make sure the system boots to the right uh, space. And then from there, that means that uh, that A, B swap space that we have at the head of the disk, the rest of it we're gonna dynamically partition as ButterFS and ensure that uh, we can uh, dynamically write out a lot of the rest of that as sub, uh, sub volumes. This makes it a lot easier for us to be able to manage partition changes in the field. It's very difficult to be able to kind of, in a smaller spaced domain, move things around uh, after the fact. So with all this functionality combined, we have a really uh, elastic experience that can uh, boot very quickly into a ready state. So here's a different perspective of what this looks like. We minimize the fixed block partitions and get ourselves into a state where we can have dynamic sub-volumes as quick as possible. This means that all of our critical components for booting and getting to that ready state, the kernel, the inner MFS, are all in uh, uh, highly atomic um, update paths. And we're offering recovery and partition uh, provisioning states so that when you're in the manufacturing process, you can actually uh, load a manufacturing uh, a state so that way you can have end of line testing code easily accessible. Or if your device gets into a place where it can't do anything at all, it can go into a recovery mode and maybe uh, reach out for a USB update or uh, a means of being able to help the user that this, uh, owns this device to recover it. And as I mentioned, the use of ButterFS for the dynamic data, allowing us to prevent ourselves from having to be able to do too much repartitioning after the fact. We're promoting the use of extensibility by means of building on top of Yocto. Yocto is great because we can handle a lot of the uh, creation for these custom platforms, meaning that all major vendors should just work. This gives us the ability to offer first-class support for NXP, Texas Instruments, NVIDIA, Jetson, STM. And it allows you to be able to more easily build and extend with custom hardware. What this means is out of our Yocto build, we end up producing platform images that will check into our own managed repository using DNF to be able to ensure that there's the uh, dependencies between them. And with that imaging repo, it gives you the ability to quickly get up and running. We'll see that more of that in a second. 
uh, with the uh, platform and security, uh, we're focusing on creating CLI tools and a runtime service to be able to make it easier for you to be able to provision these devices and get up and running with trusted attestation of sensor data. Machine learning is going to require this, not only as a critical application, but more later. <clears throat> Let's take a peek at some of the application development components. As I mentioned, we want to be able to focus heavily on the use of systemd portable services, system extensions, and system configurations. This makes us be able to have runtime reproducible, uh, reproducibility and immutable fault tolerance. Uh, this means that when we boot up the system, using these image-based updates, we can layer together and compose that so that we can have a pre-configured deployment that we can end up uh, having reliability in the field. In addition, we're providing development containers that allow you to be able to build a lot of your um, work and use things for like NFS-based hardware on the loop development and debugging. Imagine that the use of uh, containerization on your desktop allows you to be able to take your source repository, build it into the container, into the application binary, combined with the SDK provided by Yocto uh, and Sysroots with the layer metadata, and over NFS, we can mount that to where the portables for the systemd portables would actually end up seeing a uh, a directory-based um, version of the portable service that is mounted and reloaded for you. And in CI-CD, this means that we can end up just easily being able to push this to container image repos. As I mentioned, we want to focus on rapid development. It's difficult when you're starting with hardware to be able to get up and running quickly. And so we want to make it so that all of the things that we build for those common platforms are available in the image repo that you can mix and match quickly and get up and running with a highly secure domain, but still a freedom to be able to move without the reproducibility issues. You can also use this in a mixed mode to be able to allow you to take your own custom images and blend it with avocados by a means of being able to compress and uh, append your keys into the inner RAMFS by means of just adding into the CPIO archive. And for heterogeneous processing domains, we allow for uh, bind paths to be able to, well, in this case, this is just system deisms, bring in any uh, firmware that you want to package as part of that service and use remote proc, let's say, to be able to load up remote processors. For portability, well, we have all the basic uh, things that are disposable. Th th things like NSpawn and VM uh, that you can use to bring up portable services for testing. And to be able to make them lean, you can strip out any of the base distribution that ships with them to be able to make sure that on the target, it's ending up taking the smallest amount of space. Well, let's take a look quick at some of the manufacturing benefits that we're looking to propose. In manufacturing, the root file systems and layers can be encrypted as written as block devices. This is part of the benefits of being able to do things a little offline. Uh, and that allows us to be able to do more of zero trust uh, manufacturing. Um, that means that we can use public key infrastructure to be able to um, uh, uh, pre-encrypt these devices and then write that as a single pass instead of having to do it in an online conversational manner. And we'll use systemd repart to be able to ensure that when you boot the system, you're not having that manufacturing time write a lot of zeros or anything like that. Here's an image of the, some of the complexity that we end up seeing when it comes to these designs. Um, when you manufacture devices and burn keys in, it's usually a very conversational approach. You have to put an unsigned bootloader in so that you can generate hashes and then burn e-fuses so you can get the signed bootloader in and then get the signed kernel in and encrypted images. It means that there's a lot to be able to go out and uh, write and we want to be able to comprise that into an easy to use CLI. For the first user experience, this is important. Often devices shipped with stripped down versions of firmware that mean that we want to split this into smaller chunks so that it's more easily updatable. Operating compression uh, on deltas means that those deltas aren't as efficient and they end up actually taking up a lot of space or they're heavy over the wire. And for maintenance, we support things like automatic rollbacks with fast uh, bootloader rollbacks that you'd get on like the IMX8 uh, boards and things like that. For observability, we end up working with support to be able to uh, remotely stream kernel panics using RAM oops, uh, or connecting to your running system with uh, journal remotes and even uh, system control. So, you want me to cut?
Hi. Uh, I will fast forward as to say that we have a lot of propositions that are based off of the work that we've ended up producing at Peridio. Uh, we'd love to be able to get more of your involvement in this project. We're built for a lot of different domains. This project is heavily inspired by the, uh, uh, the use in uh, government, defense, critical infrastructure, and networking technologies. And effectively, we would uh, uh, appreciate visiting us, avocadolinux.org. We're in the process of migrating a lot of the site content to there. And so when you get time and you want to be able to pr uh, pitch in, uh, it would be great to be able to get your involvement further. Uh, thank you for your time. Sorry for the uh, dry <laughs> weather. Yeah.